Okay, welcome everybody. This is our G2G Dallas meetup for May. We have a whole group of organizers and most of these are on the display or on the call tonight. Uh, my name is Luke and you can probably look around and see everybody else on the uh, video. There's Jacob, uh, Jennifer, uh, Joaquin, I don't think he's on tonight, uh, and Stacy. And so if you ever have any questions about GUG, feel free to reach out to any one of us or all of us. Uh, you can reach us through the Meetup site. Uh, there's a contact organizer for the group and you can find it there. And there's the URL for the Meetup site. I assume most of you are coming from there because that's where this video <laughs> link was posted. So. But if you're watching later, uh, our sponsor for tonight is Bottle Rocket because we're using the Bottle Rocket corporate <laughs> Zoom, which allows us to have, I think like 300 people on the call. So we can definitely handle the crowds uh, here. So uh, pretty good, invite your friends, tell them to check out the next meetup. But yeah, we don't have to limit it. So it's kind of nice. Uh, we have a map of the facilities. Uh, this is you and your bathroom is probably somewhere behind you or to the side. So uh, I can't help you much more than that. But we always provide a map of the facilities. So it feels like we should. Uh, we do have a Slack group. I don't know if everyone's in there, but uh, it's pretty easy to find. ggdallas.slack.com. And to get an invite, you can do that. Or if you send me a chat message through one of the dozen ways you can get in contact with me, I will create a invite for you. And that kind of leads into our general call for speakers. So we're always looking for people that are willing to give more long form talks, I guess you'd call them 30 minutes, 45 minutes, that kind of thing. And now we will move on to our feature presentation for the evening. Okay. Uh, although she doesn't need an introduction, I will give her a short introduction. Uh, Jennifer McGee is a longtime co-worker and I'll say friend uh, of myself and many of us here in the community. I give her credit for really restarting this meetup that uh, you're attending uh, about 10 years ago. So she's been a critical part to uh, growing the Dallas community uh, in technology. And so uh, I admire her for a lot of reasons. Uh, from a professional standpoint, she's worked at a lot of places over the years, uh, Valtech, ADT, and currently working at Bottle Rocket Studios. But uh, she will be introducing us to a very interesting tool called Macoon. So Jennifer, why don't you take it away? Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, I cannot see you guys at all because of speaker view, but that's okay. All right. Okay, everybody, if you're like me and you've been doing app development, and I'm certain other kinds of development, you know the kind of biggest headache the biggest um, problem having to do with app development is the APIs. So if you're developing an app, they almost always rely on a backend API, um, pretty much no matter what kind of app it is, unless it's some sort of tool for your phone. But we've been kind of encountering this problem a lot um, at Bottle Rocket and just for myself. And they came out with something they decided to try recently um, spearheaded by a colleague of mine, Russell Mirabelli. So some of these slides are his and some of this content is his. So I wanted to say thank you to him for that. Um, and so anyway, we're trying to deal with APIs and as we're working with them in our apps, we encounter some major concerns. Um, mostly, usually what's going on is they're late. Um, you talk to a client and they say, hey, yeah, don't worry. Our APIs are gonna be done way before you guys start developing. And of course they're not because it's software development and it usually runs late. So that almost always occurs. Um, there can be all, some other kinds of concerns that you might be worried about or that you might be encountering. Um, 
they're often unstable because while they're being developed, they, you know, somebody at you're working against a dev server or um, something like that. And what happens is they push code and there's a bug with it and the API goes down, or maybe they're still setting up the login or whatever. The API goes down and you're, unless you've got some sort of solution, your day is kind of shot. And there's other things that we kind of wanted to do just not to use the real backend server. Um, I've encountered APIs that are rate limited or that the client has to pay for like every single time you hit them. Um, it's nice to have a way that you can kind of deal with that without having to actually hit the real thing. And then of course, um, one of the other big things is you wanna be able to simulate delays and errors. And so for all of those things, we kind of want something. So they kind of put together a set of requirements and what we were looking for when we were looking for a way to mock APIs. Um, there's a couple different ways to do that, but these are kind of the requirements that got put together. Um, the first one is we want something that works even when the server doesn't. That's just like the baseline, no matter what kind of thing. So even if the server is completely down, we want the ability to mock stuff. Um, we wanted no code changes in the app. Before we instituted this, before we instituted this, basically what we were doing is we were taking REST calls, getting the JSON, we were packaging up that JSON, we were putting it into the app, and then we were changing, you know, changing the code of our app to now in smart ways, but changing the code of our app in order to use that JSON. But um, even though that sections would be stripped out and wouldn't be shipped with the final product, um, anytime I have to actually change my app to actually test it, it makes me kind of, kind of makes my skin crawl. It makes me shiver. Um, so we really would prefer not to have to change the app. We want the app to kind of run as is, and then we change something external to it so that we were looking for that. We wanted a user-friendly GUI, um, both for ourselves and for QA. Um, the faster you can mock, the easier you can mock, the faster and easier your testing is when you're developing and the faster and easier your testing is when you're a tester. And we especially wanted something that would be usable by our UX um, testers because they make, a lot of them are fantastic. Um, well, all of them are fantastic that I've encountered. They're very intelligent, but they may not know how to code. So you don't want your, you don't want to be the bottleneck. You want your QA team to actually kind of be ro rolling along without you. And that is better for everyone. Um, in addition, we wanted something that had minimal setup time. We didn't want to involve DevOps. We didn't want to have a server that was going to be running somewhere else. That was, I mean, there are a lot of solutions like that, that are like mock API server and stuff like that, where we actually are running a real live server um, that just happens to spit back canned responses. Um, those can work, but we didn't want to have to maintain that. And we wanted everybody to have to, to be able to run their own with on their own device without a, a problem and possibly even have the ability to work if they didn't have internet. Um, now, for the most part, that's not, doesn't happen very often, but that is kind of what we wanted, you know, to have set up is that everybody's machine could be pretty self-sufficient. We don't have to wait and put in a ticket or have DevOps do it. So we wanted something kind of self-contained and we wanted to be able to simulate delays and errors. So we were looking into that and we ended up coming, we ended up coming up with kind of this two-pronged approach. Oh, allow errors, yeah. And that two project approach is first, Charles. Um, Charles is a standard into the industry. Um, Charles is nothing new. Charles is wonderful and glorious and we all love Charles. Not that there aren't other ways to do things, but Charles is fantastic. Um, basically how Charles works is it acts as a man in the middle. So Charles listens to your network traffic, records your network traffic and passes it on. Um, then what happens when you come back is that the network traffic comes back to the server, it goes back to Charles, Charles listens to that and passes it on to you. So it records all the network traffic and then it lets you manipulate it somewhat. Um, what we're going to be using Charles for, Charles does have a lot of capabilities. Um, it doesn't have all the capabilities of the full solution I'm going to talk about, but what we're going to be using Charles mostly for in this situation is to redirect the traffic to Maku. So then we've got Charles, and then we've got Makun. So it's packaged for mocking HTTP. It's open source, which is lovely and wonderful and glorious. And I'll talk a little bit more, even why that is better a little later. Um, but it's also free, which is glorious. Um, I will say that Charles is, when I started developing, Charles was completely free. At least I'm pretty sure. Um, 
Charles is no longer completely free. However, it is fairly cheap and there is a trial version that allows you to do almost everything you need to do. Um, it allows, I think it has like a 30 minute timeout, but you can do a ton within those limitations. And I, I, highly, I still highly suggest Charles, um, try it with the trial version and then try and get somebody to buy it for you. Um, but Macoon is free, which is so good because nobody likes having, not being able to use a tool because they can't get someone to approve it because of the 20 bucks or the 50 bucks or the $2,000, you know, whatever. Um, it's been around for about two years, so it's newish, but not that new. Um, and it, the biggest thing we really like about it is it allows really easy configuration with a great GUI um, compared to a lot of other mocking solutions out there. So let's kind of talk about, so this is the normal flow, just when we have an app and we have a server, this is just how things normally work. This was kind of what we were doing before Makun. So just goes through Charles, Charles is acting in the, in the middle and recording the traffic and we're going to the server and it's coming back to the app. Then this is a possibility. Um, this is kind of the baseline of what I was talking about. You know, Charles acts in the middle, it passes the traffic to Makun, Makun mocks some of the traffic, mocks the traffic, passes it back to Charles, um, passes it back to your app and you can modify it at those different locations and places. Um, this is a pretty good result, but it's really missing one key component that thankfully Makun does allow. Um, if you're like me and you're trying to work with a server and you're trying to work on your app, um, it's really a pain to have to mock everything because you've got, I mean, it's nice to have a nice Postman collection where you have, these are all the different calls that are possible and this is a response for any of them. But if I'm just working on feature X, I don't really want to have to worry about setting up and having set up feature Y if that doesn't exist yet, just in order to be able to get to feature X or have some other way in the app to get to feature X that isn't through the normal flow. I would like to use the normal flow of the app as it's built, if at all possible. So what we kind of, the kind of the total solution is this nice solution where Makun also has a proxy mode. So you can go, App goes to Charles, goes to Makun. Makun passes on all the stuff you don't care about to the real server. The real server passes back the real data, it goes through Makun, it goes through Charles, goes back to your app, and nobody is kind of the wiser. And that is fantastic and is what I've been using for probably the last six months. And I really like it. So does anybody have any questions about that before we continue? I'll do a slight pause and then I will, nope, okay. So this means, I, I just like this, this app. Um, we don't have to have a mock build. We don't have to have a configuration or switch for turning on the mock build because it's all outside of the app, which is so, so good. Um, although you don't have to have any spatial, any assets based into the app. Um, responses can be modified in real time. QA can do it and it's great. Now I did want to mention some cautions. Um, Yes, you're mocking. Yes, it's fantastic. Yes, the world is glorious. You are no longer stopped by the fact, assuming you have a contract, that the API team hasn't finished things yet. You can just say, well, this is the contract and this is the data and I have this example and I can go. But um, it is, if you've got everything all set up, it can be really easy to forget that you're not um, do it using the real server. So go ahead and just try and keep that in mind. Um, Try not, it, you really should test with the real data at some point for sure. Um, it's still a push for that, still, you know, it's still important. Um, and the other thing is you want your data to be recognizable so you can tell when it's happening. You can do that by a name. Um, <laughs> I like the Charles Mockington the third. that's from, that's from Russell, but I, I liked it so we kept it in. Um, but, you know, just be careful with your mocking. The other thing is you can, um, that I've encountered somewhat, if the APIs are lagging way, 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 way behind us, then it can really be a concern because you can mock things. And if you are creating the mocks um, and you're creating the contract, you're not getting that feedback about exactly how the data is. So the real data can kind of slap you in the face. Um, and this does occur, watch out for it. Um, so don't overuse the tool. Um, but it can still be, it can still be a lifesaver. So 
hopefully what you're saying is, enough with the sales pitch. I want to see how to use this thing. So let me go ahead and start showing you that. Um, I'm going to start off with some basic stuff about Charles, just because um, you need to have Charles set up and it, it can be a little tricky. Um, I'm, oh, you guys can't see the top of my head. Sorry. Um, now, I, I did want to say I'm not going to go into, there are some, you could do multiple talks about Charles. Um, I'm not going to cover one of the really thorny issues about Charles, which is um, if you're working with secure data um, over an HTTPS connection, that Charles can be a little bit tricky to set up. I'm not going to cover that here just because it's kind of out of scope of what exactly I want to talk about, but I will have a reference to it at the end. And there are, Charles has really good some really good documentation up, up there about how to do that. Um, it has to do with, you know, setting up your certificate in Charles and setting it up on your device and it can be annoying. And so if you take this home and go start playing with it, you haven't been playing with Charles before, um, do be aware that setting up your certificate in Charles to pass the secure traffic through is a little bit of painful. Um, I apologize for that, but it's worth it. Like in the long run, it's totally worth it. Uh, but look for resources online on how to do that. Okay, I can see you guys now, which is fantastic, which I, is making me very happy. Does anybody have any questions before I continue? I don't see any questions, so I'll go ahead and get started. All right. Oh, I think Raul had his hand up. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, you're probably going to cover it, but I was just wondering, um, uh, with starter kits, like you could use this with a web app, doesn't have to be a mobile app, right? And and the second question was, um, you know, I like the idea of having seed data and then combining it with debate, uh, data that's generated randomly um, so you can get some of the edge cases. But um, do you have that kind of, some sort of data generation aspect to it? So no, uh, Makun doesn't do data generation. Uh, there are other solutions that are better for that, but um, that's not really a strong point of Makun. Um, as far as the website, yes, I think you should be able to do that. I have not personally done that, but I think that should be a possibility. Sounds cool, thanks. Okay, any other questions? I guess the first thing I'll ask is, how many of you guys are currently using Charles? Most people aren't? Okay, good. So I'll just cover some of the real basics about how to get Charles kind of set up and connected to, and how to connect it to Macoon, because that is kind of vital for being able to use Macoon with your app. Okay, so you guys can see my screen. I've got this lovely app over here. It's a very simple, super simple app. Um, and let me go ahead and get started with the first step, which is the first thing we kind of want to think about. Just a second, let me rearrange my screen. It's got a little bit funky. First thing we kind of want to think about is how to, kind of the first hurdle is how to connect Charles to our, um, our device, whatever kind of device we have. Um, there are two main ways to develop on devices. Um, the first one and the one that when I started developing, most people started with was, you know, this emulator. But also you might want to connect to a real device. There are a lot of benefits to connecting to a real device. So I'm kind of going to start off with just how to connect Charles to your emulator or to your real device. Um, the first thing you need to know is how to find the IP of the device. Um, and if you're like me, when I first learned about Charles, I was like, no, no, I know how to find IPs. I'll just use command line. I can do this. And all that is still true. But Charles is nice. Don't make it hard on yourself. Charles has this local, local IP address feature. And it will say, hey, this is the IP you should use. And so use that because it's easier. Why would you make it hard? Um, so that's kind of the first little bit. Um, so once you have that IP, kind of the next thing you do is if you're on your emulator, you kind of go into this setting here, and these are the settings for your emulator. Um, okay, so I'm in my emulator, and I go into my settings, and the emulator has really come a long way um, in the recent years. Um, it very nicely has this proxy setting here. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to set up Charles as your proxy. 
Um, so here's where I'm using the, that IP address I got. And here's the port number I'm using. Um, I think you can change it for Charles, but I've always used 888 or um, So that's fairly simple to set up. Like I said, it does get more complicated if you're trying to do secure traffic, but if you're not, that's pretty much all you have to do. Um, there are also ways, so if you wanna do testing with Charles um, and you wanna do things like, you wanna do testing other than using the network. Say, say you want to do be testing over the cellular modem or stuff like that. That is a possibility with Charles. You can set that up. Um, you can set up the proxy with the emulator. Um, so that you can do this. Um, I'm not going to show you how to do it right now, but um, it, it is a possibility too. So you're not just tied into using the wireless. So that's how to basically set up the emulator. Now, let me see. I have a video for this other one because I didn't want to try and share my real device live. So, if you're trying to set up Charles with an actual device, let's go ahead and watch the video. Come on. Hopefully there's not sound. So what I'm doing is I'm going into, I think I went a little far already. Oop, nope. So you start off with your settings in your device. Then what you do is once you've opened up your settings, you go into your network and internet and you choose your Wi-Fi. Then you select, select the network you're on. In my case, it's Cephid. And you can go down to your advanced options. This is where you set your proxy, which will be manual. And you will set in there the same things we just said in the emulator. You go ahead and say, hey, I want to use um, whatever that IP address was and 8888. So that's fairly simple. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about that before I kind of move on to the next pieces? No? Okay, cool. All right. So we've connected Charles to the emulator. Um, we have connected it, whether it was an emulator or whether it was a real device. Um, now we have to try and connect Charles to the Mac room. So if you guys remember, so right now where we are is we're kind of at this point. Um, we want to get here. So let's go ahead and show how to do that. So Charles has a lot of really fancy, nice features. Um, one of those features is, under tools, it has this map local, which I highly suggest, and map remote. Um, basically, how, what map remote is, is for Charles, if you want to say, hey, Charles, use this other server as if it was you, that is what you do. So if you were going to do one of those other um, solutions where you're doing a different kind of server, this would be an option if you didn't want to change your code in your actual app. So you can go ahead and do map remote and it basically you just take and you re you say hey well i'm this is where i'm from this is where i'm to you add the route and that's pretty much it it's fairly simple um in this case for macoon i'm going to be doing local host because macoon is running on my machine and i'm going to do, be doing port three three thousand and six um there is nothing magic about three thousand and six it's just a port that i've chosen um so cool. Um, let's see. There, I will also say that in Charles, you can also get to that same thing. Um, if you select a route, just do map remote, and you can kind of do that here too. All right. So that's kind of set up that way. All right. So now we have Charles, and it is hitting Macoon. Um, well, not quite yet. We have Charles, and it's mapping to somewhere and that somewhere is a local local host and it's port 3006 but we need it to connect to macoon so it's a little bit it's time to talk a little bit about macoon um so let's talk about some of the basic pieces of the things when we need to work with macoon okay so the the first part is our environments macoon can handle multiple environments at a time each environment is kind of like a dummy server um, in, I think the technical definition is, is environment is a group of routes. 
but since I haven't talked about a route yet, that's not very helpful for you yet. Um, so when you create an environment, it just will put, you know, here, it'll put a new environment, it'll give you a port, um, nothing too fancy or crazy at this point. Um, you can name them, which is lovely. You can delete them, you can copy them, you can duplicate them. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. So here is my environment. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about routes. So, routes. Okay, a route, if you guys are used to using, do, to doing RESTful, um, working with RESTful APIs, um, routes are just what you would think of as your normal route. They're just the path um, that you're gonna make, be making the call against. Um, but they, Macoon, this is one of the places Macoon really truly shines. It gives us a ton of very easy, easily configurable stuff to do with these routes. Um, but the first, let's just talk about some of the basic pieces yet. You know, you can say what kind of, what kind of call it's going to be. You put your route in, you can name it, you can add notes. Um, all of those are fantastic. Um, but it starts to get more fun kind of down around this section. Um, so the first part is this status and body. So for, well, first part is let's talk about responses. Um, you can have multiple responses, and this is really, really nice. So each of these routes can return multiple different kinds of things. Um, and you can delete them, you can name them, you know, they are useful. Um, so if you were working with, if you've been working with Charles previously, you would know that for Charles, you can go in and you can definitely say, hey, for this route, go ahead and you know, give me this response instead. Um, you can do it with breakpoints in Charles. You can, you can do a lot of that with Charles. You can do it with map local in Charles. Um, but it's not the most user-friendly thing possible. Um, here with Macoon, I've got a GUI and I've got an editor right here. So um, I can just paste in my JSON and edit it in place. I don't have to do like what I would do with Charles, where I would say, okay, when I'm working with Charles and I've been using map, map local previously, I would say, okay, I've saved my file, I've saved it someplace, I've set up map local. Um, I mean, let me go ahead and show you real quick. So if I was gonna do doing this in just in Charles for just this feature, and I would be going to map local, I would have to have, I'd have to enable it, and then I'd have to add it, and I'd have to have a local path where I'd save the file here, and I have to choose the file, and I have to edit the file somewhere other than in Charles, and then I'd have to change it, and if I wanted to, you know, it, it works, and it's powerful, but it's just not as nice as this. Um, in this case, I am here and I am, you know, working and I'm, I can see what I'm changing and I can just change it in place. Um, and when I change something here, okay, let me talk a little bit more about this UI. Oh, sorry. So let me talk a little bit more about this UI. Okay, so I've got my server and I've got my route. Okay, so now the, I can tell kind of what state this, this route is in. So it's here and it can be running. I can start it or I can stop it. Um, also, when I change things, let's say I add a response. Yeah, maybe that won't trigger it, but when I change some things, I'm not still still working, learning on learning exactly what. But when I change some things, it will actually identify the fact that I've changed some things. And this, oh, if I'm if I'm running, and up here, my route will actually tell me it needs to update. I'm not getting it to do it right now, but it will do it. And it will kind of put a little, like a little spinny, a little circle, an orange circle here. And that'll say, hey, things have changed about your route. Go ahead and stop it and start it again. So it's not, um, it's nice that it shows us, um, but it can be a real gotcha when you're first using Macoon that it'll, you'll need to, you'll make changes and you won't be seeing them yet. And it might be because you need to kind of update your route. So watch out for that orange circle to kind of update your route. Um, another nice feature over here for your routes is 
once you've got them all set up, you can toggle them off and on. Um, oh, here, there's the server needs to restart. Um, so this route is now off. Um, what, if I just wanted to turn off this particular route and not have it happen, and if I wanted to have a bunch of different routes stored, I can turn them off and on this way by toggling. Um, I can do the same thing over here with my server or with my environment. I can turn it off and on the same way. So that's really nice. Okay, so I've got my um, I've got my actual JSON here. I can edit it in place. I am fairly happy. Um, I am changing my JSON. Um, I'm making my call over here. Like right now here, this in this example, we're getting a list of stores. Um, this store I've changed here to say, as you see, Jennifer's Macy's. But if I wanted to get rid of that and make it crazy Macy's, I'm good. Let me go ahead and do that. Now, my apologies, this app doesn't automatic it actually does some caching so I have to clear the data but it will do it for us oh I didn't restart my server no but it did it okay that's cool so now you can see now it's crazy Macy's if I needed to test a particular case that was crazy Macy's for some reason that I cannot think of at the off the top of my head I am good maybe I wanted to change the phone number to be able to call someone particular or whatever so I'm doing, I've now accomplished the Charles map local functionality um, and I'm able to change my JSON and I didn't have to leave my tools. So that's really nice. Let's talk about some of the other cool things that um, Mockerlin can do. Um, the first, the, the kind of the, the, the real like killer feature in my opinion of Mockerlin is rules. Rules are glorious and wonderful. I love rules. Um, you can kind of add a rule. Um, you can do you can do rules based on a bunch of different parameters, based on body path and query string and header. Um, and you can say things about them, like you can you can say you can put put the name or path or header variable in here. Um, I've been using header a ton just because of something I'll mention a little later. But you can put you know put your values in here, whatever they want, and then you can put another value. Um, it will accept regex. Um, all of that is really great. Um, you can add multiple um, headers, multiple rules. So you can say this and this and this and this and this, and that is wonderful too. So if you want to only mock it when I am returning a list that contains Macy's and I want that, I want Macy's to, in addition, have a phone number or whatever, I can just put multiple rules in, and that's really wonderful. Um, now, I will say, let me go ahead and talk a little bit. This, this is me talking at Bottle Rock a little bit, but it, it's still cool. Um, so one major kind of um, limitation that Makun currently has, it, you can't see it on my screen, unfortunately, um, because I've got the, the, the fix in, but um, the current version of Makun that you get for free by downloading only combines rules using AND. So that was being a huge problem for me on my project, you know, because, and I'll explain why a little bit later. Um, and so what happened is that um, basically one of the web developers at my um, company, Hiroshi, um, came up with, I, I went to him and talked to him about my problem. And since it's open source, I said, hey, this whole only and thing is really killing me. And he said, can, can you can, can you see it? It looks like it should be pretty easy to add the ability to have or. And he said, you know what, you're right. It is super easy. Well, not just me. It was also one of my, my iOS counterparts. He should get his credit. Uh, sweetheart. Can you tell us the rules? Baby, I'm in a, I'm in a meeting. Go shoot. I need daddy. Go talk to daddy. Hi. I need, I need, I need to know the rules. Go talk to daddy about the rules. Go. Daddy doesn't know the rules. Daddy doesn't know the rule. Guest appearances. It's a, it's a bonus you have feature. The rule. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so anyway, they have uh, they have put in that. Um, so we put in a uh, he's put in a pull request to Makun to say, hey, please add 
and this or so that our rules can be more full featured and more flexible. Um, and in eight days ago, or maybe nine days ago, I was going to ask you guys all oh, to please go vote for this feature because it's super useful and I use it all the time and I love it. But um, right as I was preparing to give this presentation, I saw this and I am so thrilled. Um, so it turns out that it's, we don't know exactly when yet, but we are actually getting the OR thing in. So within the next month, if you want to try and use Macoon, you should be able to use OR and it is so much better. Anyway, okay, now that I've done the kind of like, like little pitch, but I, I'm still so pleased about it. I, I really am happy. It's really been making my life easier. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about rules, um, but I also want to talk a little bit, let me go ahead and move things real quick, about um, a little bit more about responses. So it's not just that you can have rules. Wait, there's more. Um, I feel like an infomercial. Um, you can also have multiple responses. So to go with the rules. So you could say, well, if you, when this happens, I want this to this this JSON to be returned. And when this other thing happens, I want this JSON to be returned. You can do that. Um, you do that by adding a response. More, multiple responses can be on a um, one route at a time. You can name them. Naming them, I love to name things. Uh, maybe I'm weird, but it's so useful. So, I can't spit all. Um, and those will kind of now show up in your responses for that route. Um, also, I wanted to mention this blue um, flag here. Um, that's the default response. So if none of the rules match, the, the, the default Macoon behavior is um, that it will always return this default response. Um, I'm not actually a huge fan of that. I like the fact that there is a default. Um, there, there is this, we have added this in our default response, but I can't guarantee whether or not you guys will see that in your version. I'm not certain if that's included in the pull request. If not, maybe we can ask them to try and do that. I don't know. I can't promise. Um, I do not do make that decision, but hopefully we'll get that soon. We'll see. So we've got response, different kinds of responses. We have different kinds of rules. You can edit things in place. You can also go, if you were working with a team and you wanted to have a file, uh, like say you, you're working in place, but you also wanted to save a bunch of different responses to a backend solution, to like a separate um, source control. Say like you had a, a bunch of canned responses um, and you wanted to save them out as individual files, you can do that. You can link to a file. So that also works. Um, I will say one gotcha I've encountered is that if you link to a file and then you kind of turn it off, it will not return the response here. So kind of watch out for that. Um, make sure the file is really there. Um, it's not a huge problem, but it's a thing. Um, you can also I know we mentioned earlier latency. For each particular response, you can say how much latency you want it to have. Um, so if you only want some of your responses to be slow, you can do that here. Um, you can change the headers. I haven't had a lot of reason to do that, but that doesn't mean that it, there isn't a good reason. Um, you can also change the global latency up here. So all of these are fantastic features um, and just wonderful. Um, all right. Um, so does anybody kind of have any questions about rules? Looking at people's pictures. No? All right, then. But wait, there's more. Um, I know earlier we were kind of, remember we kind of talked about, we've got, I was talking about really for your kind of solution, you want to kind of want this full thing here which I haven't told you how to do yet. All I've told you how to do is this piece and put in rules to determine whether or not what you return when. Um, so I wanna talk to you about proxying. So Macoon also has a proxy um, configuration. Um, and how that works is it's a setting on the environment. So once you're on the environment over here, there you can go to the settings and then you just kind of said enable proxy 
and you put in where you actually want your calls to go. And it's pretty simple. Um, well, actually, honestly, it's reasonably simple as far as a concept. I find it's a little bit, just to get the exact thing, a little, it's a little bit kind of fiddly, but it is, um, it, it works and it, once you've got it set up, you don't have, never have to worry about it again. So it is, it works and it's awesome. Um, it also will go ahead and pass through HTTPS. Um, sometimes you have to enable cores just depending on what kind of, what kind of security you're dealing with, but it does do, it acts as a proxy and it works and that is good. So now you've got that full end to end from app to Charles to McCoon to server, back to McCoon, back to where it replaces the thing back to Charles, back to your app and you're great. Okay, so we've got those kind of pieces. Um, I did want to mention this. This is that port, which is kind of magically put. So now we've kind of got the whole flow. Um, you're now pretty much able to do what you want to do with, you know, with regard to mocking data or use for testing and developing your API. You can use Charles, you can map remote, you can go ahead and set up your environment, you can set it in proxy mode, you can create a route, you can add rules, but there are um, some other things that we have found really useful while I've been using this tool. Um, and one of those is that I just wanna kind of point out is the environment logs. Um, so if you're using Charles and Lacoon, and we're, especially when you're first starting, um, it can be hard to figure out, you, there is a kind of a lot of configuration, right? So you have to configure Charles, you have to make sure Charles is working, then you have to configure Macoon, you have to make sure the results are getting to Macoon, um, you have to make sure Macoon is returning the right thing. So for about whether or not Charles is working, that's not too hard to do without Macoon, right? You just, you set up Charles and you see what comes back over here. So that's all well and good. But with regard to Macoon, it also provides us these environment logs. And these are, I found to be super useful when we want to, um, when you want to figure out whether the problem is with your child's configuration or with your Macoon configuration or with your server. Um, so something goes wrong, something's, you get a, you're getting a 404 or something's coming back funky. You're trying to figure out why. Um, I found these environment, to, environment logs to be invaluable because you can at least see, okay, yeah, it did get to Macoon. Macoon um, either passed it on and got a result back or, you know, what happened here. So you can go home and look at your environment logs, see all your calls, see what was going on, and it really helps. Um, the UI here is a little funky because it's got this back, and that's how you get out of it, back to, you, back to your uh, route, but it works. Um, so all of that is going. Okay, so we've got that kind of stuff. Now let's talk a little bit about working in groups. So if you're working in a team, and it's more than just you, um, okay, I've already talked about how to end latency. If you're working in a team and it's more than just you, all of this is great, but how do you make it so everybody doesn't have to do everything themselves? Um, when we were first just working in teams, what I was suggesting is, hey, everybody have their own configuration set up, and everybody, you know, just kind of save those JSON files out to a repository. But as I've been working with it for the past six months, um, what we have found to be the most useful is the fact that you can share a configs. Um, so I'll show you kind of how to do that in Charles and how to do that in Macoon. So if you're in Charles, and you're in, and somebody has managed to get map remote set up correctly. Um, then you can go ahead and go to your tools and map remote. And Charles has this feature export and import. And so you really only have to set it up once. Um, and then you just export it and you input it. And you can put your remote rep, your map remote into your source control for mocking or for your servers. And then you don't have to mess with it again because it is kind of fiddly to get set up and you don't really want new people on your team to have to spend a lot of time on it. So that's pretty easy. And the good news is Macoon has a similar feature. It also, it exports as JSON and it's pretty easy to use. Um, 
So you're, if you're in Macoon and you want to do, you've it just got this import export here. Um, it says it can do Swagger. I haven't I haven't played with the Swagger import export, um, so that's cool. But I just haven't played with it yet. But it does go ahead and import a file from JSON and export a file to JSON. Um, one kind of gotcha I did want to mention is it will export all of your environments. Um, so if you've got a bunch of stuff um, and you hand it off to your teammate they will probably be kind of overwhelmed and like, what do I use and why and where? Because you've got like 12 environments and each of them has 16 routes and each of those routes has a bunch of responses and what's going on here. Um, I would suggest kind of be kind to your teammates and yourself. Um, I would suggest kind of exporting a single environment and I'd even go so far as to say a single response um, and kind of saving that out as a JSON file they're not difficult to combine um, and you know because you can always just move the JSON and that kind of keeps things cleaner um, but th this is going to be your mile your mileage may vary you know of course you can work with it however it works for you um, but that's kind of what has worked for us um, one other gotcha is that if you import um, it will not if you import the same thing more than once so say you import your um, you import one the route and you import it again, it will just create another copy. So it won't update your route. So just be aware that's gonna happen. It's not really a huge problem. It's a slightly annoying, but it's okay. So that is something I would kind of be on the lookout for. All right, um, does anybody have any questions about any of that? No, okay, um, then I just, Pretty much I saw of... a hand from Jesse Derrick. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. I was on my, uh, I'm still on my phone, so uh, I apologize. I don't have a video. Uh, just going back to uh, when you were talking about rules, do you have the possibility of like uh, chaining uh, multiple calls? So based on a response you get, um, say for example, you authentic authenticate a user, you you try try and register user after that. Can you actually sort of make a series of calls on uh, Macoon? I don't think so. I mean, you could probably do it by the logic and the rules. I haven't tried. So anything I say is going to be a guess. But I okay. don't believe so. But I think you yeah, could do it based on, like, if there were multiple different kinds of calls, you could definitely do it based on the logic of the rules, right? You could be like, well, if this rule returns, if this call is this call and it returns this, then do that. But I, I haven't actually tried like this, 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 like shading them like that. Right. And that's the, I guess that's a problem that Postman has. So when you have, I don't know, multiple servers, or if you have a server that's trying to make, you know, a number of calls on Postman, you physically have to make the first call. And then once you get a response, you make the second call, you know, manually. Um, yeah. So I was wondering, yeah, yeah I was, you know, it's, it's interesting because I'm seeing these rules and I can see how that can definitely be implemented. Yeah, and I, I do suggest Postman. I love Postman. We use Postman. Postman is fantastic. Um, I don't think this has all of those features that Postman has. But, I mean, it's they're just kind of different tools for different purposes, right? Fair enough. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, Raul had a question. Yeah, just uh, to piggyback on that a little bit, um, I was trying to conceptualize along the same lines. I like use cases, like sim simple use cases as neutral artifacts when you're, when you're designing something so that you can kind of hand it to testing. And when you're testing, you can always just generate a new set of tests if the tests go bad because the use case is good. I was just trying to picture how to tie, how to tie some use case scenarios um, to, these, uh, to these paths. Um, it sounds like it would have to be through the naming. Uh, because you can't really do, uh, it doesn't seem like you could do a chain. Yeah, um, I, would, I think if you're going to be using this for testing, I, I haven't been for automated kinds of testing. I don't know if this kind, is yeah. possible. Um, you know, I mean, for testing, testing, like you're, um, wh where you're doing it manually, I think it's great. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure how you would approach that. I'm not saying you can't do it, but I just haven't tried it. And I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, I only had kind of one last thing um, is that I have been working with a, um, a GraphQL endpoint for the last six months. And I'd say anybody who's working with GraphQL, this is invaluable. You need Makun, um, at least for, for any kind of mocking. And the reason is that if you've done any work with GraphQL, now I will say Makun does not officially support GraphQL. Um, and there are a lot of GraphQL features that Makun does not support. So M GraphQL has the, op the concept of subscribing to something to, and like kind of listening for updates. Makun is not going to support that. Um, maybe Makun will someday support that. Some people are asking for full-fledged um, GraphQL support, but that's kind of not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the basics of being able to mock things um, easily in GraphQL. Because the problem with, but the problem with GraphQL calls is that if you're working in GraphQL, um, all of your endpoints are the same route. So like all of my calls are my, whatever my route is, slash GraphQL. And so that makes working with Charles or a lot of other tools that are more developed for REST type servers, just not work well. Um, because like, say you're working with Charles, and you're trying to do Mac local. Um, you're going to catch all your calls and it's just not great. Um, I've had my QA have been able to kind of make something sort of jury rigged kind of work with breakpoints, but in Charles, but it's, it's painful. It's extraordinarily painful. Um, with Makun and with these ORs and with the pass through and the ignore, de ignore default response, we've been working with it for six months and it's been great because if you're working with GraphQL, um, they, each GraphQL call um, has this concept. Oh, I, did I get rid of the stuff I wanted to? Ah, I did. E each GraphQL call has a concept of something called a, an operation name that's in the header. Um, and what you can basically do is you can go ahead and say, hey, I want my, if, when I'm doing my, oh, when I'm doing my rules, here we go, operation name. And that is kind of, is a lot like the path in a REST call. And you can go ahead and use these rules um, to, and to kind of help you with that. So you can set your operation name, and in this case, it would be get loan, and only catch on that particular operation, which lets you do a lot of the things that you couldn't do with, um, that you couldn't do easily, because otherwise you just, you know, be kind of fumbling. And it's been working great. Um, I will say the ignore, ignore de default response and the or are vital for making it work great. Um, just because you can, the or lets you have, because without the or, if you're doing operation names, um, then that is your rule and your whole rule is tied up. Um, if you have the or, you can do operation names and other rules, which is great. And the ignore default response, right now, if it always returns the default response for a route, um, you can't do use the proxy setting. And that means you have to mock everything, which is also painful. So, but if you have those two features, which I'm hoping will arrive in Makun with the pull request, um, I'm not certain about the ignore default response, I'm hoping, um, but I do know the or. Um, it, it's working, I, I have not been suffering. I've been able to do all the mocking I needed to do. I've been working with GraphQL and it is going great. I'm not saying there aren't any other GraphQL mocking solutions out there, but when we did research, um, I, I didn't find anything I loved. And there were some GraphQL mocking solutions that were built in with GraphQL, but they're more of that um, data generation kind of result than what I was looking for with, you know, hey, QA, go in, you know, test this scenario. And for that, I'd say, you know, if you're working with GraphQL, get Makun, use the rules, it will help you and save your life. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? That's pretty much all the content I had. Oh, I got a couple questions. Mm -hmm. Jesse? Uh, yeah, so can you give, I guess on that same point about comparing Postman, uh, I don't know if it's a dumb question, but can, you know, other than that responses and changing responses based on, you know, whatever you get, uh, like in the use case scenario, what's the, benefit of using this over Postman? Uh, I'd, I, other yeah. than the rules. 
like since you've experienced Postman and you've used this, what, what are some of the things that you find yourself not using Postman for and using this for, I suppose? I'd say it's just the ease of use with regard to stuff. I mean, Postman is still fairly easy to use, but I just find this easier. Um, and like I said, I've been working with GraphQL, so I didn't really, haven't really had a choice. So I haven't been able to use the two together right now. Ah, I see, I see. But, Thank you. but I mean, I'd, I'd say it's the ease of, use, ease of use and the flexibility, although I still do love Postman. I mean, I, and Postman is very powerful and it's fairly easy to use. Okay, so, uh, so there are no um, like major features that you see no, on a day-to-day -day basis and on the queuing that you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say, okay, it's not on Postman per se. I'm sure there are. I just haven't done the, I, I haven't done the mental analysis and I'm just not pulling it up off the top of my head. Yes. Um, okay. But no, that's fine. That makes sense. Uh, thanks for that. No problem. How long had you used, like how long have you used Postman, Jennifer? Just to give some context there, like you use Postman on some projects for quite some time. Uh, well, but I'm not... Actually, I haven't used Postman as long as you might think. Um, it, I've said I've only started using Postman on my last project, which is kind of embarrassing to admit. I kind of didn't want to admit that. But so I'd say only about a year. So I am not a full-fledged Postman. Like people can make Postman do tricks. People can make Postman, like they can set up environment variables and Postman will handle your um, authentication token for you, which Makun will not do. Postman will automatically refresh your authentication token, which Makun will not do. Um, Postman is good for recording stuff. I mean, Postman is great. I'm not saying Postman isn't great, um, but it's not as good, I'd say, for, um, kind, at least in my experience, for easily and quickly replacing parts of calls. But I'm not saying that you can't. I bet if you really knew Postman really well, you can do a lot of stuff with it. Cool, Raul. Yeah, in your uh, personal use of this, how big do you see your? <laughs> have you seen your rule sets get? What's a medium and a big? Pretty small, actually. Um, most of the time, I just need a couple. Um, this is, seems to be more of an interactive kind of tool where I'm working and I'm using it while I'm working just to kind of scratch things up. Um, I'd say I, I, it is nice to have the, the multiple rules. But I would say they haven't gotten huge. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I see a Carlos, maybe. Yeah. So I would like to ask: Is do do you know if there is any way to record the traffic? For example, imagine that, as you were mentioned before at the beginning of the talk that you're having a server that is unstable, uh, a backend that is not very stable. So is there any way that you can record the session and just uh, log in inside Mukun? Okay, so Makun does have that logging feature, but I don't know that it has a record feature. However, um, it, Charles does have the ability to do that. Um, Charles can record all the calls and all the results, which I highly suggest. And anytime you have a bug, you should do that. Um, but Makun and Charles together are still not, like we have used some other solutions where you say, you just hit a button and say, hey, record that, save it, um, and it gets saved out and then you can just replay it. Um, that mm -hmm. feature is not in here. Okay, thanks. And Postman is also great for that. <laughs> but. Anyone else, just feel free to speak up. Um, since I'm not hearing uh, uh, other questions, this is a bit off topic, and just tell me shut up if, if it's not allowed. But um, you mentioned GraphQL, or uh, well, some of us who haven't tried it yet. Um, is it you know is it comparable to say using a real time database? Is there like a feature for sort of uh, consumer and subscribers on um, on GraphQL? So okay. say for example, so yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So I can, I, I think I can answer, but I, while I have been using GraphQL across six months, we haven't used that feature. Um, I believe it does have that feature, but um, I'm talking a little bit out of school because, you know, I'm, I'm newer to GraphQL, um, but I believe so, yes. 
Um, okay, and I, go ahead. But in general, you prefer, I suppose, GraphQL to just normal RESTful providers, I suppose. I'm torn. I'm really torn. Um, I know it's always difficult asking opinions. I know that, uh, but you know, just curious you know, no, no. to, to hear. There are and if anyone else wants to answer as well, um, I'm open to. Other. There's definitely pros and cons in my experience. Um, things are, I think, as GraphQL matures, yes, I would prefer GraphQL. Um, but as it's younger now, the tooling is not as mature around it, and that's caused us heartaches. Um, I do think that GraphQL can be much more efficient than normal RESTful stuff, right? Because, I mean, you're instead of getting everything, you can get only what you want, which is great. But um, I think that if the backend team who's using GraphQL um, isn't, doesn't do a great implementation, um, our, by the way, we've been lucky in that our backend team has been doing a really good, really good job. Um, but then it, you don't really save a lot. You see, maybe like you kind of need the support in the back end for, for um, GraphQL. Um, I'm neutral. It, this time it would have been fast. In this time for this project, in this circumstances, I think it would have been significantly faster if it was a REST type environment. But I think a lot of that is just due to the faster development, not faster um, usage of the app. And, but I think a lot of that is just learning time um, a lot of that is also just, like I said, tooling not being as mature. I think as, I like GraphQL in general. Um, I think as it matures, it will be a good, a good tool to work with. Um, but right now, it's, there's just a little bit of drag from it being young. Um, I do suggest if you're going to be working with GraphQL, definitely get graphical. Um, I li I've liked that. Um, so, yeah. Graphical. Uh, and what is it? What is that exactly? What's, what is graphical? Graphical is the, is like the GraphQL UI. Um, let me see if I've got, oh shoot. I wanted to show it to you, but um, I don't, I have it loaded up with, with um, uh, the client's data. So I don't really want that's to. That's fine, maybe, maybe, maybe just paste in a chat, I suppose, or something. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's the, graphical is the GraphQL UI, um, UI client that you can run on your machine to make calls against GraphQL um, to kind of get the results back um, outside. It's kind of like a Postman sort of, but not really. Postman is also adding GraphQL support, but there's, I think they just entered beta. I'm not sure what state they're in. I haven't watched it super closely, but it's starting to add that support, but it's not quite there yet. Yeah, I've got a I've got a web app, but I don't have a lot of experience yet on on connecting the database to a web app because I'm just sort of new to the front end web dev stuff anyway. Um, but but I, I really want to encapsulate my business logic, and something doesn't feel right about uh, Firebase real time database. I sometimes I wonder, do I really need it to push all the data out? Um, you know, I really want to control the cost. Should I go with something else? And in learning about uh, startup kits, you know, making your own kind of a thing, you know, th th they're using like Node and Express to serve their own RESTful uh, data. But, but as far as going to production, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit stuck with some of these same questions. I'm like, well, do I need, do I need something else uh, like a GraphQL and, and just have a, a separate service for the data? I, I do want it all on the Google I want it all in the Google Playground because everything that I'm doing, whether it's sheets, add-ons, or or web apps, if 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 everything is on GCP or in in Firebase or Google Land, um, at, at least in my mind, then the data is in that bubble, and I I don't have that that trip that round trip. I could save a couple hundred milliseconds of having something hosted somewhere else. At least that's my that's my my current thinking. I'm just trying to get my mind around it. Um, I hope that makes sense. I think it makes sense. I just don't think I'm the right person to know. Um, I, I think if my API team, API lead was on here for the, my API team, he'd probably have some really good feedback. But since I didn't do any of the, the work setting anything up in the back end, I just don't know how painful it was. I know that he chose to do it again after something else, but I don't know. Unfortunately, I can't really speak to it at all. That's cool. There's so much to learn. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I do, um, I do both backend and uh, sort of Android mobile. And just regarding that question, I, I think normally it's, it's, it's always what f the, it depends on the feature you're building. So for example, anytime we end up using sort of um, 
any sort of uh, consumer subscriber, um, uh, sort of publisher subscriber uh, uh, backend as a service is when we have a feature that we know is going, going to benefit from that. So like a chat feature or a tracking feature where we're trying to track drivers, for example, that's really helpful uh, versus having to just pull the server constantly. Um, and I know, so there are a number of options. So Firebase, of course, is the, um, you know, one of the, uh, the ones everyone uh, talks about, but um, there are so many other people doing that, you know, pass, uh, pass server does that. So if you don't want to be stuck, you know, in a vendor locking for Firebase, you can use the open source sort of pass server and they have something called, um, if I remember correctly, I think it's called like pass events uh, to build that whole system. Uh, there's also, you know, uh, 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 Kafka, Apache Kafka, which is, you know, basically pushing to topics and subscribing to those topics. But those get really, you know, a lot more complicated, depending on what sort of data you're, or what sort of features you're building. I think that's, um, that's what would sort of decide that uh, 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 option. But I will say the easy, the fastest and easiest thing to spin up and just run as fast as possible is Firebase, because you, you most likely don't even need like anyone doing backend to, to build that stuff. You just go on Firebase and then create a project and you know, you're know you automatically sign up on the real-time database. And sometimes you're just gonna have to commit to do so doing something twice, right? To get, right. It done, get it done. So I appreciate that, thank you. If you happen to be watching the chat, uh, Eris posted a Nice link to the DFW GraphQL meetup uh, that happens uh, or that's been organized. They meet, uh, they haven't met in a while, but uh, it might be a good group to join if you're interested in. Yeah, we do um, a few introductions to GraphQL. Um, we've gone over the different uh, languages you can implement it in. Uh, we haven't had a meetup in a while because of well, this situation here, but. Um, to your point, the biggest pro to GraphQL is the contract. Contract is tight. And as a full stack guy, um, it's great when you have a contact with the dev on and you can just run with the app. Um, probably the biggest con, though, is um, there's a learning curve to it um, on both the backend setup and the UI side of it mostly around um, pagination because they, uh, Facebook implemented real computer science based pagination and not the offset limit hack we've been doing for 20 years, 25 years. Um, so they, there's that. And um, the other thing uh, to your earlier question about subscriptions. The subscriptions are great, but it's not out of the box. Right, so um, most people use Apollo server or some variation of Apollo kit that's underneath a whole bunch of stuff. But subscriptions, uh, once you get into subscriptions, you need dev DevOps on your side. And I don't know, outside of one company, Prism, I think they just changed the name last month or two months ago. Um, there's not a lot of, um, out of the box support for it. So if you're just doing using straight GraphQL where you just want to, hey, I want to um, do a query, a, a mutation, you know, get a post, delete, those types of things. Um, it's pretty simple to set up. I've thrown one up in a day in uh, using AWS Lambda. And um, I literally just called the REST APIs that were, we already had as a POC and that, that took like a day. But once you get into like a more complex thing um, with the, cause it's very object oriented and the whole name that graph is weird. I don't like that they named the graph anything, but yeah. Um, but uh, I will put in the Slack here when the GraphQL meetup group starts having sessions again. Okay, I'm all ears. Cool. So I, there's some, uh, something I've been wondering about GraphQL, actually, as a consumer of GraphQL. Um, it seems like it could be possible to more easily do some sort of attack against it, where you, like, request a ton of different data. Um, have you guys thought about or seen? Right. So 
that was the question last year. It was a big question because of uh, um, so out of the box, there's no support for detecting circular design. If you design your schema in a circular fashion, out of the box, it's not. Um, but because it is, what GraphQL is, is a data proxy, okay? The smart data pro proxy where you build the smartness in. And so what has, um, what you have to do is build your rate limiting there. So what most people do is they'll do a thing like, oh, Firebase has two good data persistence that I like, and maybe um, Azure has something nice, and oh yeah, there's a Redis service over there, and they'll set all that up, but then they'll implement a GraphQL that is the proxy to all those things, and what they'll do is they'll build a limiting into it. Um, hence, that's why the pagination is kind of complicated you could i i don't use it because i don't want to learn learn learning yet i haven't had a reason to but um i just use the offset limit but what you do you can easily build in the stops for like oh hey here's my limit on this this size data here's my limit on this size da da data and if you build a multi-tiered architecture um you can increase those limits depending on how wide or now you make it yeah but it is your responsibility to, to block block that yes yeah. that's your question not the front end developer the back end developer. oh yeah but i mean i just i was like how much do you need to worry even though it's not maybe my job it, i do worry about the product in general so session yeah any any final thoughts i know we're kind of getting a little late here uh but i think it's been good it's been a great great talk any final any final questions before we kind of wrap it up cool well uh thank you again jennifer this has been uh, really amazing uh just to hear from somebody using this technology and I think we can all agree that it's uh, certainly interesting and seems like a, a really useful tool. And um, it's neat to see that some of the changes that are being made by developers are being fed back in. And so uh, there's hope there that if uh, maybe if it doesn't work for you, you can even add the features you want to it. And then um, it's uh, been really good. Uh, so I will uh, stop the recording and I'll make a few final announcements after that.